Australian White Ibis, Threskinorus moloka, a.k.a. Dumpster Diver. The majestic ibis is a much-revered bird with deep roots in Egyptian mythology. But this isn't Egypt. It's eastern Australia. And there are no pyramids or hieroglyphics here. But there are plenty of trash dumpsters, the preferred habitat of the Australian white ibis. The white moniker is somewhat of a misnomer. The birds might be white underneath all that grime, but the ones you're likely to see are dingy gray or brown, or whatever color of the dominant food stain from the bins they've been occupying. Viewing tips? Anywhere you'd find a pigeon in America, you'll find the Australian white ibis. Just don't expect them to be white. Odds of seeing? Quite high, and almost guaranteed if the sanitation workers are on strike. In episode 89, I speak with Evo Terra, podcaster, author, and self-described professional contrarian, about his unique observations of Australian birds and his appreciation of the natural world. Welcome to the Casual Birder Podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take time to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. In my show, I'll tell you about the wild birds I've seen, speak with other enthusiasts, take bird walks, and share stories from listeners around the world. I know Evo Terra best as the host of the thought-provoking show, Podcast Pontifications, but my birding side was piqued when I heard him make mention of an article he wrote describing the birds he'd encountered while living in Australia. Evo shared the article with me, and when I read his wonderfully quirky descriptions of these birds, I knew I had to speak with him further. Evo is one of the very first podcasters, and has hosted over 20 shows since he started in 2004. He also co-authored Podcasting for Dummies. He is deeply passionate about podcasting and he runs a strategic podcast consultancy, providing advice to businesses. Evo, thank you very much for joining me on the Casual Birder podcast. Thank you very much for asking me to come on. I enjoy talking about, you know, odd random things like Bird watching, right? That's our topic. We're talking about birds. It, it is, Bird. but I thought you're an expert. So am I? Am I wrong about that? <laughs> We're going to find out by the end of this conversation. That's for sure. You're very well known in the podcasting world, and you were one of the very first people to have a podcast. They've said there's around nine hundred thousand podcasts out there. What was the number of your podcast? Uh, I had the fortieth podcast. Ever. That is amazing. Isn't that crazy? When was that? October 14th, 2004. Wow. Yes, I can recall the exact date uh, <laughs> that it happened. But yeah, that is yeah, fantastic. Way back then. And you obviously love it because you're still podcasting today. Almost 16 years later, here we go. It's went from being a fun hobby of mine to uh, my full-time gig. I am a professional podcast strategist for companies all around the world now. Yeah. That is wonderful. And it's just, you know, something to think about for those of us that are just starting out. If we just wait 16 (laughs) years. I can give you a list of things not to do if you would like those. And I'm guessing a lot of those things were actually mentioned in your show, uh, Podcast Pontifications. Yeah. Podcast Pontifications is a podcast about podcasting, but where other podcasts about podcasting tell you how to do something, uh, my show tells you what to think about, talks about the future, talks about where podcasting can be, uh, as opposed to how to put all the dials together. So all those shows are great and fine. I love I love many of the, the PAPs podcasts about podcasting that are out there, but I like to take a little higher level approach to things and um, and make people scratch their noggins a bit. And they're nice, small segments. Always less than 10 minutes. Yeah, I've got a timer running and that's that when that gets close to nine and going, oh, I'm talking for too long. I should shut up now. I, I really do enjoy listening to it. Thank you. So I'm thrilled to have you uh, in the, I was going to say in the room, you're not quite in the room because we're speaking via Skype. Um, would you just like to say whereabouts you are? I am in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's toasty warm outside, and we'll get much toasty warmer as we progress towards summer. Ugh, 
very hot. And I'm here in windy, cold and wet Basingstoke, so dreaming about the heat somewhere. <laughs> now, it might seem to people outside that it was strange that you should come on to a birding podcast, but you had actually noticed some birds on your tour. You spent about three and a half years traveling the world. That's right. Yeah. In at the end of 2014, my wife and I decided to sell quite literally everything that we owned and go travel for a, a while. The plan was to go for a year. So during that year, we hit 13 different countries in, in three continents um, and really enjoyed, enjoyed our time. I spent about six weeks in the UK in spring you people do a terrible job of spring, just so you know, <laughs> wet and cold <laughs> nonstop. But um, towards the end of that uh, time, we we were in Australia uh, in between Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving and Christmas. And by the way, great time, great place to go in November and December, Australia. Great, great spot to be. Um, We were there and looking at the bank accounts, realizing that, well, the party's coming to an end, so we must do something different. We didn't want to return back to America, and we, on a whim, decided to go to Bangkok, Thailand. We'd spent a little time in Bangkok, and as soon as we got there, it seems, my wife was picked up uh, in the international school system. They really are looking for uh, experienced long-term educators, which is exactly what she's done. She wound up becoming the principal of a private school in Thailand. And so for the next two and a half years, we made Bangkok our home base as we bounced around Southeast Asia and uh, explored uh, even more of that world. What an amazing, incredible experience. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it certainly was. Along the way, I mean, the reason I, that birding is coming up here is I we became travel bloggers because we were travel podcasters and then we became travel bloggers. And I had an opportunity to write for a company, an, an outfitter. They make clothes and gear for people, uh, and uh, they contracted with me to do some writing for them about the travels uh, that that we were experiencing. I was a, a paid travel blogger, if you will, and one of the articles I wrote, which I believe you you have had a chance to read now, was about bird watching in Australia, which is why we're having this conversation today. We went to Australia ourselves um, about six years ago now, and as I was reading through your article which describes a variety of birds and tells you about their behaviours. But I just could not stop laughing because the way you described the birds was just absolutely wonderful. And I wonder if you could just tell me about a couple of the birds in particular. Sure. It, I, I would be happy to because Australia, as as you know, Susie, and any of the listeners from Australia or if anyone has travelled to Australia, it's weird. Australian animals are weird. This is what happens when you isolate creatures from the rest of the world for millions of years, they get weird. <laughs> and that and there's no way to describe it other than other than weirdness that happens in there. And it's but but also fascinating, you know, just just amazing. Like so very common things. Like I think my, my favorite one is I think the first one that's in the article. And it's a it's a pigeon and it has the most demonic eyes on the planet. It is just, I mean, it's, it's, it looks like a bird. It looks like a regular dove. It's got some interesting colors on the on the wings underneath, like some, some greens and some blues, which is very pretty. It's got this crest on top of its head. And you, and you think those would be the two things that would draw you to the bird. No. No, it's this red glowing almost eyes that are around this thing that just, you know, make, makes this gorgeous bird terrifying, which to me is the perfect way to describe Australia. Beautiful place terrifying. Everything will kill you. Australian magpie, Cracteus Tibison, aka Dive Bomber. Before you go looking for magpies, make sure it's not swooping season. No, I'm not making that up. There's a swooping season that every Australian knows about. Australians prefer to keep this bit of key social knowledge to themselves, mostly so they can watch and laugh, as these black and white beauties dive bomb unsuspecting visitors who get too near a nest. And by near, I mean anywhere within a 5 to 10 mile radius. The magpie's call is an odd, almost underwater sounding warble. Not nearly as iconic as a kookaburra, but not nearly as annoying as the cockatoo. And if you hear it, you probably won't get dive-bombed. So you've got that going for you. Viewing tips. Backyards, roadsides, parks, they're everywhere. Odds of seeing. 
75% chance if you're looking, 100% if you're not ready for the swoop. One of the things I noticed when I first got there was how the sound of the birds was so different. Everywhere you went, you could hear mm. fantastic sounds. That's what I noticed because I very much am attuned to listening to birds sound. Sure. How did you note, apart from the fact that there was something with a crest and glowing red eyes, <laughs> how did you notice the birds? How did that impinge on your consciousness? Yeah, well... Birds in Australia are very different than birds in America that I'm used to. You know, we have songbirds, I'm assuming in the UK and you know, similar things, you know, birds sing us a sweet little song. Birds in Australia scream at you uh, more often than not, right? The, uh, the, the, they're the cockatoo that all over, I don't know if, if it's a sulfur crested cockatoo, I believe is what it's called. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a gorgeous bird. And we were staying in a, in a place in near the Whit Sundays up in Australia on the West coast. And Beautiful, very quiet and serene, but there was one tree, just one dead tree that the cockatoos, when they – that that was their place to go. And they just scream at each other and you and they just make this really, really loud noise all the time, which is great unless you're trying to produce a travel podcast <laughs> – where you're trying to interview someone without the screaming sounds of the birds that that are behind you, they're just really, really, really loud. And then there's the uh, there's the lorikeet, which is very pretty, green, orange, blue, beautiful. Looks like a small small parrot. Holy cow! Is that thing just scream and make horrible noises nonstop? It's just always, always making noises. And then there's that weird kookaburra, which I'm probably not pronouncing properly because I'm not I don't have the proper Australian accent. That is nightmare fuel at night. I mean, if you heard that thing, you would assume that someone just escaped and is coming to get you. No, it's just this toad-shaped bird up in the tree that just makes this wild, crazy sound. It's just fascinating. Laughing kookaburra. Darcello Novagine, a.k.a. the crazy person in the woods. The kookaburra is the iconic Australian bird. Although they aren't all that easy to spot, you almost certainly won't miss hearing one, as their warbling sound carries for miles on end. It's really quite remarkable that such a noticeable song, and though a little unnerving at first, a quite pleasant one to hear, can come from such a small, compact member of the Kingfisher family. Viewing Tips Listen first, and slowly walk through the woods. That's not your imagination making you think a crazy person is stalking you, it's a kookaburra. Odds of seeing, 50-50 unless you think you might be lost. Then it approaches 100% just to unsettle your nerves further. I guess there were times then, as you mentioned, you were trying to record no. the birds were not your friends. No, <laughs> not even a little <laughs> bit, my friend. Yeah, Constantly interrupting didn't matter. And here's the great thing about Australia with birds. You don't have to go to the bush to hear these birds. I mean, walk down downtown Brisbane, you'll see a flock of lorikeets and cockatoos. Okay, you won't see flocks of kookaburra, obviously, but go to any of the parks. That's where they'll hear. It's not like I went off into the wilderness. They've got, there's a, there's an Australian turkey, which didn't know existed, by the way. Didn't know there were turkeys in Australia, and there are. Very different than American turkeys are. But I first saw one, and it, it, when we were actually in the bush, my wife and I were off the beaten path going to find some hidden beach. And I and I, I found this, I saw the turkey. And so I grabbed my phone, I looked it up and I said, oh my goodness, this is an Australian turkey. And and it was reading about, you know, stay away from the nests because they, they could get a little territorial and stuff. And I'm, oh, this is great. I've got, I found this rare, elusive, uh, this turkey. We go back to the town, which is about, oh, maybe 40, 50 kilometers away. And we're going to pick up some beer because you're in Australia. You have to drink a whole lot of beer. And in the parking lot, there are three of those same turkeys. <laughs> So there you are with your rare bird. <laughs> They're everywhere, everywhere. Wildlife is everywhere in Australia. Before you went to Australia, had you really noticed birds? Where, where do you come from originally? Do you come from Arizona? No, I'm from the, the middle of America, a little state called Oklahoma is where I am from, and from the country. I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in small, tiny towns, which are terrible. One day I will have enough money to go back and buy those towns and then pave them. Just going to put a big <laughs> layer of concrete. Anyhow, um, but beyond that, my, my grandfather uh, worked for uh, an organization called the Corps of Engineers. And this is a government body that is in charge of the lakes in Oklahoma. Because every there's like 10 lakes in Oklahoma and all of them are man-made. 
you know, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they we dammed a small stream or a river and a lake came behind it. And my grandfather worked for the Corps coming out of World War II, got his job for the Corps of Engineers and retired from the Corps of Engineers. It's the only thing he's ever done. And was in charge of, he was the project manager for, I think, three different lakes that I can, I can remember. And so while my grandfather was by no means a trained naturalist, he was, born every sense of the word, a naturalist because he ha- had at his command thousands of acres of property that, you know, most of it was flooded, right? But all of the other area around it where the wildlife would be. And so he would, he rescued, um, he rescued a hawk and an eagle that he had, that someone had hit with their car, both of those at different times. So he had a hawk and an eagle that were in his office that he had somewhat, somewhat domesticated because he raised them back from health and just an encyclopedic knowledge of the local wildlife in that area. And he was kind of my hero growing up and and all the way up to like major adulthood and taught me a lot of appreciation about nature and wildlife as, as well as, you know, from birds to fish, to large game, to worms, to the, to the whole, the whole gamut. Right. Right. So you already were aware of birds then from, from back home. Very much. When you started traveling, was Australia the first time you really noticed them? No, because, you know, being attuned to creatures that are around, I, I, I've traveled a fair amount and I, one of the first things I do is look around and say, what's different about this place? You know, what, what is unique here are things that I can't get in other places. So each, each country we went to, you know, of course, most of the animals in Europe are kind of the animals of Europe, right? So <laughs> birds, birds can at least fly across the English channel easily enough, right? That's not that big of a deal. Yeah. But when we got to Southeast Asia, about halfway through that first year trip, that's when things really became vastly different for me because now I'm hearing sounds in the wilderness that I, I hadn't really heard, whether it was birds or reptiles or other animals making these noises. Uh, that's when it became much more noticeable. And the, and the colors of plumage increase drastically the closer you get to the equator, right? Because birds in, in America, sure, we have our jays and we have our cardinals and some of those are pretty. But when you get to, when you can really see these tropical birds and all their real splendor, that really gives you a new appreciation for uh, for, for the, the local bird wildlife. Well, I, I was just thinking about this. So your local birds, birds you see in Arizona, mm-hmm. in Phoenix. Yeah. You're fairly far south there, aren't you, in the, the yeah. U.S.? Yes, we are. Do you tend to have quite colorful birds there? What sort of birds would you have locally? Well, not most colorful birds that are native to this area, but because this is the southwest, which is a typically pretty warm area, even when it even when winter hits, it's rare for us to break freezing. I mean, if that happens, the news is plastered with freeze warnings and people go rush outside. And I'm not joking when I say this, put blankets over their cacti. We really do. We don't worry about pipes freezing. We worry about, you know, protecting our delicate cactus from, from having its buds broken. But because it is a very uh, mild winter here, we have swarms of wild parakeets that are not wild, well, they are. They're more. I guess I'd say a swarm of feral, feral parakeets. Yeah. Right? They were they were released. Who knows where it was? And so I know of several flocks of uh, parakeets that are here. There are some uh, cockatiels as well. Those tend to get out because those are common in pet stores. But they get out and find other cockatiels be, and be because they're here and they can survive uh, quite well. So we get that sort of of color uh, of of birds out here, but. For the rest, you know, we, we I am fortunate in Arizona that we do have a condor uh, course, in, in the yes. area. We My wife and I used to live in a little town further north, kind of midway from in Arizona. And there was a condor breeding ground right outside of uh, probably mid 10, 15 kilometers from, from the town and uh, on some on some cliffs near a near a um, near a stream, a river. And you could if you were timed it right. You could see the you know one or maybe two condor that would actually show up, um, and you know as the scientists were there, hopefully to <laughs> get them to breed so we can make more condors. So, yeah, lots of raptors, lots of birds of prey. Uh, but when it comes to the small, colorful birds, those have uh, come from somewhere else and have, just like most of us in Phoenix, now call it home. Right. Do you get hummingbirds there? We do. We have a lot of hummingbirds out here. Uh, it's very common to see porches with hummingbird feeders on them. Uh, my wife's a photographer, and she she probably has an entire CD filled or CD. Oh, I'm showing his age over here. An entire hard drive <laughs> filled with with hummingbird photos. You know, hummingbirds are are great to take pictures of because you know they just sit there in one position for a very long time. But 
my wife is the kind of person who she wants to take the action, the fr- frozen action shot, which means we have to spend like $18,000 on a lens that's fast enough to catch the hummingbirds, you know, wings that's batting up and down. But yeah, a lot of hummingbirds as well. Does your wife have her own uh, website? Does she display her photographs? That's a good question. I don't believe that she does. We we have a few of her photos from our travels over at um, a website that's Shivo, Sheila and Evo, Shivo, Shivo.wtf. I just love generic technical domains. Um, yeah, you can see some of her photography over there. When you were staying in Bangkok, mm. uh, what was the bird life like there? I've never been to that area. So it's a giant city. I mean, Bangkok has 14 million people and it's just a sprawling, gigantic mess. But of course, it's surrounded by jungle, right? You are, people think that you live in the jungle when you're in Bangkok and you don't. You've really got to go north for that. But around the outside of it is, 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 a, is a wild area. Not, not jungle like deep jungle book stuff, but, you know, it's, it's undeveloped land. Although there's lots of rice paddies that have been cropped up around the area. It's, it's fully domesticated. So there's a fair amount of, of bird life uh, that, that does exist there. Um, there, I, I wish I could remember the name of this one bird, but the further out on the outskirts you go, you you will hear this bird quite a lot. Uh, it's, it's it's got a very distinctive uh, sound that I'm not even going to try and emulate. Everybody loves the sound this bird makes, except for me. And the reason I'm the one that doesn't really like it is the first place we stayed in Bangkok was kind of the outskirts, and every morning at 4:30 in the morning, didn't matter. What day it was, 4.30 in the morning, this bird would start making its little noise. Except it's not a little noise. It's like he had had some friends from Australia who came up and taught him how to make a lot of noise. And it was just really, really, really loud. So it is one of those polarizing sounds that you either love or you grow to appreciate when you go. And for people who go to Bangkok or go to Thailand will probably go, oh, what a lovely sound. Yeah, imagine hearing it for nine months straight. Every morning. It's like a horrible sound that a rooster would make to wake you up each morning. Just popping in here to say that I discovered the bird Evo was referring to was the Asian coal, which has a call that sounds a little like a high-pitched peacock crossed with a chicken. On behalf of that bird, I (laughs) apologise. But isn't it interesting that that then impacts on your memories of that place? You know that 4.30 in the morning, that was it. And how wonderful to be able to wake up at four thirty now and not hear that. Right. Yeah. Now I don't have to worry about that. That is that is true. <laughs> you mentioned that you were staying in towns, but you did some travelling around when you were when you were in the different countries. Mm-hmm. What kind of things were you looking for? I think when my wife and I decided to make that trip, where we were going to travel and we didn't really have much of an agenda, we. We call ourselves we, we called ourselves the opportunistic travelers, not in a bad sense, but because of we let opportunity choose where we were going to go. So, for example, for the six weeks we spent in the UK, the vast majority of that time was spent either in uh, Nutsford, just outside of Manchester, um, or Sheffield. And I think we only spent maybe three or four days in London proper. And so when people hear that, they go – I'm sorry. You went all the way to the UK to stay in two towns I've never heard of. Could you explain why you did that? And the reason we did that is because we were house sitting. And that's where the house sitting assignments were. We please come stay in my home for three weeks, rent free, and you know feed the dogs on occasion, water the plants, and the place is yours for three weeks. It's a wonderful way to travel the world. You have to be willing to be extremely flexible. But if you do it right, the 2015, my wife and I spent, we paid for hotel rooms 30 days for the entire year. There were 30 days we had to pay for a hotel room. The rest of that time was either spent house sitting, uh, staying with people that we met along the way, and I'm not kidding, it just kind of happened that way, or with connections we had made, I had made mostly because of the podcasting world and other social media things we've been involved with. Uh, yeah, it, it allowed us to really to travel off the beaten path. You know, when we, I tell people we stayed for three weeks in Copenhagen. That's not true. We stayed for three weeks in a little town called Kakaday, which is about 40 kilometers north of Copenhagen in a much, much smaller area, closer to the water, away from the hustle and bustle of the city. The cities are always close enough for us to get to them. 
I guess what that allowed us to do was instead of having the very touristy experience, which is pretty much how we traveled prior to this trip, we were able to really get in and I don't want to say live as the locals do, but at least live among them for a while without any crazy expectations that we needed to go see a show or do something else on the on the tourist wagon. We we just did what locals did and in, enjoyed that life for a year, which was which was a blast. To have spent a whole year and only have to get a hotel for like 30 days. That is wonderful. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. That we could spend the money on the travel to get from place to place. Takes a lot of coordination. And I am not the coordinator. That's my lovely wife, Sheila D's job. She figured all of that out. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we had an amazing experience that we couldn't have replicated in the other way. And it, we still look back on it with, with fond memories uh, for every step. Had you ever traveled when you were younger? Uh, a little bit, but like most Americans, most of my travel, you know, this is a pretty big country. <laughs> so we, we, we have a lot of things and a lot of differences within this country. And then we also have two countries north and south of us. But that's all we had ever done. I mean, I, I didn't leave the country officially until I was grown. I took a trip to, I think I took a trip to Mexico when I was 18. Um, I didn't go to Canada until I was in my thirties and other than Caribbean travel, I hadn't really done anything. So we'd gone North and South, but nothing East or West. So this decision to sell everything and just see where the wind takes us for a while was rather ambitious. Our, our friends and family, well, people who didn't know us all that well, thought we were crazy. Our close friends and family went, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's something these weirdos would do. So having seen those birds while you were away and, and having had the influence of your grandfather mm -hmm. um, on the wildlife, yeah. are you aware day to day of the birds that you're seeing around where you live now? I, th I think I'm more aware than I was previously because people who grow up in the most beautiful places of the world, eventually you become immune to those. You just see it every day and it becomes the same thing over and over again. And that that's very much true for me. I mean, I we live in Arizona, which is gorgeous. We have amazing sunsets and we, we lived in northern Arizona, which has some amazing red rock features. It's just, you know, beautiful things. But you just – that all becomes the scenery. That's just the world that you live in. This travel, this trip that we did and, and plus the addition of living in Thailand for two and a half years afterwards, every day – reminded us that we're not in the same place we were before, that everything is different. And I'm fortunate in the t almost two years now that we've been back, it'll be, yeah, close to two years now, that sense of awe and wonder hasn't left me yet. I still look at things different. I still, I, I think I'm noticing more of the, of the world around me, whether that's the natural world or the man-made world. Uh, it has re-sparked and rekindled a sense of, I would like to see more about that. I notice this thing and I, I want to remember this and hold on to a piece of that and keep it with me. That's a wonderful statement to close on. The article that you referenced, yep. you mentioned it might be possible to put that out there again. I think we can make something like that work. I think if the listeners want to read about 10 really, really strange birds from Australia written by a person who clearly is also really, really strange, I, I think we can make that happen. And if people want to find out more about you, where can they, where can they find that? So I'm all over the internet these days. Uh, the good thing is if you just search for Evo Terra, I'm the one that comes up all the time. Um, I'm most active on Twitter. Twitter is my social media tool of choice. If you want to see pictures of me typically with a tobacco pipe shoved in my mouth because I've gotten deeply into tobacco pipes as of, as of late, um, that's uh, Instagram is what that's all about. And same name, just search for Evo Terra on Instagram. You can't miss me. And you mentioned at the beginning of the program, it's a nice circle back, uh, that podcast Pontifications is the short form show. I do four days a week and that's available at podcastpontifications.com. I'm very grateful to Evo for giving me permission to repost his article on my website. The link is in the episode notes. Do let me know what birds you've seen recently. I love to hear about them. Tag me in your posts about birds on social media. Or tell me about them in a voice message using SpeakPipe at casualbirder.com. And have you signed up for Casual Birder Weekly, the show's newsletter? Each week I share tips to help you get the best birding experiences, bird news that catches my eye, 
recommendations for other podcasts or books I've enjoyed, and I let you know about any group birdwatch events. You can help support the show's production by buying me a virtual coffee. Your donations help fund my production costs and are very much appreciated. Thanks to Will for contributing to the show's tip jar this week. The link for this and Casual Birder Weekly can be found in the episode notes. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing to the show. Subscribing is free and you can do it wherever you listen. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. Rainbow lorikeet, Trichoglossus hemodotus, a.k.a. the pretty loud bird. If ever there were a bird that looked like it was painted by Dr. Moreau, it's the lorikeet. Patches of yellow, red, and orange make this the most colorful little bird we'd ever seen. They tend to travel in large flocks, making for a colorful splash across the sky as they settle from tree to tree. Like all colorful little birds, their call is more akin to shrill shrieks than melodious tunes. But they are pretty. Pretty loud, but pretty. Viewing tips. Find a tree. Wait. Listen. Odds of seeing. If you can find a tree, you'll find a dozen lorikeets.